one. Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? It's that time again. It's time to get hammered. What's up, y'all? How's it going? All right, on today's show, um, we have one of the busiest people I know personally. Um, he may even give me a run for my money at times because I consider myself to be pretty busy too, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say he's got me. Um, I'm proud to call this man a personal friend. He's an entrepreneur, a CEO, a GM, an actor, which I would had no idea about this one, um, a producer, and God knows what else you got going on, brother. You seem very busy. Um, but tonight we got Mr. Uh, Pete Rivera in the house. What's up, Pete? What's up? What's up? How's everybody doing? <laughs> Hope you guys are ready to get hammered. Hey, bro, I hope you paid yourself per diem and travel pay for coming out here. Oh, dude, man. <laughs> it, was a, it was hop, skip, and a jump. You, you do live out in the sticks. If y'all have never been to Mike Bird's house, I'm going to tell y'all. Y'all need to make a trip. Bro. It's an adventure. You'll enjoy the journey here. You have no idea how many people complain about how far I live out here. I believe <laughs> it. You're a popular dude, man. A lot of people want to spend time with you. Oh, it, it's uh, it's. Hey, crazy. look, man, I'm honored to be here with you, Mike. Well, this I appreciate good. you coming, Pete. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Yeah, put it there, bro. Yeah, Let's man, we got to do this ah. without... See, we got hammered, folks. Do it yeah. one more time. It's about <laughs> getting hammered. Boom. That's right. Also, we got in the studio my guest host tonight, Miss Laura May. What's going on, Laura? Hey. <laughs> ah. I'm sorry, folks. That just broke me up. That hey. That's going to turn into a meme. <laughs> that right there is going to turn into a meme. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Edit it out immediately. Well, um, Look, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Hey, what can I say? I'm happy to be here. No, that's, that's good. Um, that's uh, your second meme. <laughs> We can just keep going, Bubbles. Just Side joke. Just fall the bottom, like, <laughs> she's got jokes. Look, I love it because moving forward, you can just take out those little audio clips from her, and you can just plug them in for every show from here on out. You got the, hey! I had told him this in shows past, and he just has not taken the time to do that. It took me coming here to recognize skills. I mean, come on, Mike. You well, got, that's, that's what you do, fun. man. That's what you do. You've got a, you got a skill for that. She, I mean. She's your woman. She's your girl, you know. Talent. Yeah. Talent. Yeah. She's got skills because you picked him. All the more reason for him to actively tune me out. So. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, so, you got some skills because you picked Mike Bird. So you, you, you can, ah, right. You picked the winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yes. All right. <laughs> Let's um, get hammered. Let's go, baby. I, and also a talent scout. So let's add that to your there you go. entrepreneurial yeah. skill. Well, Pete, um, so I've known you for like, I don't know, like a year now, years couple, change. A couple. He shaved off a year, but that's fine. Uh, well, is it two years? It's been two years. Flies. Has it been two years? Yeah. Oh, You're my God. Fun. Oh, God. We had a whole year under the pandemic. What am I thinking about? I guess Damn. I thought of him as a friend for two years. He only thought he accepted me a year into it. <laughs> That's what it is. No, I just, I'm getting old, bro. I'm getting old. I forget full memory and Wait, stuff. Wait, Mike, you how know. old are you now? Come on. Uh, 45. Okay, man. so the 45-year-old's telling the 50-year-old that he's getting old. Just duly noted, folks. All yeah, right. And now I feel really bad because <laughs> when I'm 50, I'm going to be lost. Oh, oh, my gosh. It's not that bad. Actually, 50 is the new 40. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that's true, bro. It is, I man. hope I'm going like you. No, look, no, I hope I'm going like you, man. Look, at 45, on. I was nowhere near as excited about life as I am now at the age of 50. It mm -hmm. took me, look, check this out. At 50, you know, Warren Buffett made all of his money after 50. Warren Buffett. Wow. After 50. So Damn. Warren's my idol. Only five more years for you. You can you just know, start counting down. Well, like a lot of actors didn't get their big start. Didn't he? Like Harrison Ford didn't start till he was late 30s or something True. like that. Word. So, yep. I mean... Facts, people. Facts. Facts. Hey, bro. It's like you were. I listened to a lot of your podcasts today. It's like uh, uh, you were saying. It's about drive. It's about yeah. getting out there and doing that work, putting it in. No matter what time you start in your life, whether you're 21 or you're 45. That's right. You know. That's right. Grit. Grit comes at all ages. Uh, so you know, I've known you for a couple of years. Uh, Thank you. He admits the truth finally. <laughs> <laughs> Met you at uh, Plus Dueling Piano Bar where you're the general manager. Absolutely. Um, awesome place, by the way. Thank you. Um, we're going out there this Saturday. You bet. Can't wait. Can't wait. Um, now, a lot of people don't know who you are. A lot of people listening to Hammered for the first time, maybe. And they're like, who's Pete Rivera? So give us like a, a brief background on who you are. Well, okay. So I'm no one special. You know, very humble, grounded, hungry. You know, um, still got a long way to go in life, enjoying this journey. Um, but I'll give everybody a brief background. So I was born in Queens, New York by complete accident. So I went up there two and a half months early to my great grandmother's funeral. And I got to tell you, Laura, I, you know, I had no idea. I was inside the you know, stomach, right? So evidently the Big Apple appealed to me and I decided to be born right there in the middle of the city. So I was born at the old New York Naval uh, 
hospital in St. Albans, uh, St. Albans, New York Naval Hospital in Queens, New York. And, uh, you know, I was supposed to be born at Cherry Point and, and the New York Naval Base, you know, because my dad was a Marine. So complete fluke to be born two and a half months early. You know, mom was pl- placenta plebia. I barely pulled through. She barely pulled through. We pulled through the by the grace of the big guy upstairs. And, um, and, and so I stayed there for like six months in incubator. So I have one good round ear, but one kind of folded ear because they didn't flip me over. You know, that's the real story of me <laughs> sitting in that damn incubator because they didn't flip me over. Like, like I was a little pancake, right? A baby <laughs> pancake. Flip you properly. Yeah. And so when you watch the old movies with like the, the glass casing with the two like round things with the gloves to go in there and like kind of work with the baby on the inside, that was this guy. That was me right here back in 1970, September of 1970. September 4th, by the way, birthday shout out there if you want to buy me a gift. You know, I'm just team saying. Team Virgo. Yes, Team Virgo. Boom, in the house. Right I knew I liked yes. you. Yes. I'll make All sure right. I put that on the video um, when I post it. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Team Virgo. Hashtag, hashtag Team Virgo. Hashtag September 4th. Hashtag Pete's birthday. Hashtag get him an Amazon gift card. All right. So, um, <laughs> So what I was saying is, you know, we, we watch those old movies with the, the, the big incubator and the bubble and, and the two gloves and the hand. I was in that sucker for a while, for six months, you know, up there in New York. And then finally we got released. We went back down to Havelock, North Carolina. I was there for like a year and a half. Went to Dad Got Station at Roosevelt Roads. We ended up in Puerto Rico. My mom's full-blooded Puerto Rican. Yes, folks, I'm the whitest daggone Puerto Rican you've ever seen on the planet. You know, I tell people that my Puerto Ricanness is in my freckles. You know, if I could just get them to melt together, I'd be all right. Um, so grew up in Puerto Rico to the age of nine. L- uh, Spanish is like my first language, right? So um, I-, I don't have a really good Spanish accent anymore uh, because I kind of purposely kind of push it to the background. Coming to the south and eastern North Carolina when you're like the only Puerto Rican piñata walking around, it's not a good thing when you're trying to fit in. So I kind of pushed my Spanish heritage back a little bit just to try to fit in a little bit. And, um, you know, different mentality back in 79 in eastern North Carolina, Greenville, North Carolina. And um, and so grew up in Greenville up until uh, just a few years ago. I just came to Raleigh to open up Plus Dueling Piano Bar. And there's a cool story that we'll circle back around to about Plus Dueling Piano Bar and the phone call I got from Tony on that story. Mm-hmm. We'll get we'll get to that later on. But um, So, yeah, I've been in Greenville, North Carolina, eastern North Carolina until the age of you know, 47 and, um, just, you know, Carolina boy through and through displaced Southern Puerto Rican, man. Let me interject here. So you grew, you basically grew up in Greenville. Yeah, man. I learned English, uh, fourth grade at Walcott's Elementary. Okay. Uh, then, uh, graduated from J.H. Rose High School in 1988. Uh, the Rampants, go Rampants, Rose High. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, uh, you know, been, been there, went to Pitt Community College. I didn't go to ECU. I didn't have the the money uh, mm-hmm. or the or the actual coaching and the support system around me to help me get into ECU. I just was very, you know, we grew up lower middle class, blue collar family, youngest of 10 kids, you know, and so... Um, 10 kids? 10, 10. Wow. I'm numero diez. You were yeah. the runt. I, you was, were the... I was the run of the litter. I say that all the time, Mike. You just picked that out of my, my universe. See how that works? Oh. My thought is, how... like, mom saved the best for last. Oh, Clearly, man. she had to try ten times to get this result. Okay, her check is in the mail. Um, I, I will be sure I, that she... See, I see, know what I'm doing. La- Laura got her that. first sponsor right here, just like that, you know? And that's yeah. a wrap. <laughs> well, how did it go, man, when you were growing up? I mean, like, ten kids, dinner must have been, like, were Dude, you fighting over the food? I'm going to be honest with you. If there was peanut butter and jelly in the cabinet on the same day with a good loaf of bread, it was like Christmas. You know, you had cereal, but no milk. You got ham, but no burger. Okay, I sound like Friday. But uh, but anyway, it was it was tough growing up, man. Yeah. And, um, you know, but mom did a really good job with all 10 of us. I am so proud of mom. You know, mm-hmm. you're you're in you're in your life. Right. And, and you don't really recognize you're not you don't have the ability as a child to, to step back and re- really recognize how good you have it in so many other ways. Richness can be defined a lot more than food on the table or clothes on your back or, you know, uh, shelter. Um, the love that we had, the, the camaraderie. Growing up in a third world country almost, Puerto Rico, which I don't know if you know this, but Puerto Rico means rich port. 
you know. And so, ironically, there's nothing rich about Puerto Rico. I mean, it's just like terrible. I mean, um, but you know, luckily coming from that and coming to the state side, you know, it was it gave me a good grounding, right? Mm-hmm. So, Mike, I got to tell you, I didn't know that I was poor. Like, I had no clue because we had we made up for it all in in all of our camaraderie, our love, you know, the the good vibrations, the my sisters, my brothers playing around Christmas time. We we had a good time and it was yeah. a ball growing up. Got my butt kicked from the from the boys, right? Being mm-hmm. the little runt, getting kicked around. But the girls were right there to pick me up the little tickle tortures and you know, all my sisters were fantastic. I used to sit on the vacuum cleaner as they would vacuum the rugs and stuff and it was, you know, some you make your fun, you know. What well, well, Greenville, it's known as a party city cuz you got ECU. Okay. Oh yeah. So how much did you venture out Pirates. downtown cuz I remember a couple of places. I think there was a place called Hump Hump like Humphreys Humphreys or bogies or it bogies. was like bogies. bogies yes yes bogies yeah I got bogies. into a fight in that place one time oh did man. you really I was, I was probably there I was uh oh god I just came home from leave in the military I've been okay. in Germany for like a year sure came home met up with uh, some friends of mine and we were like we're going to with the G Vegas I don't even know yeah. if it was called G Vegas yeah back yeah then. sure and yeah. um man got drunk at 19 years old no 20 years what old, year are we talking 97, 98. Oh, like man, that. I was so there. We were yeah, so... I, I probably watched the fight. You I'm might like, have been the one to hit me in the head with a no, beer bottle. No, man, I, I Somebody... would never... <laughs> <laughs> all I'm saying is an all-out rumble took place, and one of you caught one of each other's fists, and I think that happened. Oh, wow. Well, I would never hit this guy, uh, and I would never hit a Marine. <laughs> I, I was so sympathetic to all the Marines that would come on leave mm-hmm. and try to... And everybody, all the fraternity boys and all the block and tackle, oh, we can't let the Marines come here and take our mm-hmm. girls and all that mentality back then in the 90s. But I will tell you this, um, Bogies, man, that was a landmark of a place, okay? Yeah. So the owner of Bogies back then when you got in that fight was Mark Sade. Mark Sade, I know you're going to watch this, um, and I know you you, you had – Mark used to fight. He was a boxer, Yeah. right? So he won the Tough Man competitions in Minji's Coliseum in the basketball court in the arena before I used to win them. So watching Mark fight – inspired me to get in the ring and my brother Mike Rivera get to get in the ring and fight as well. So I was a undefeated amateur boxer for quite some time and I would enter those boxing competitions right there on campus at ECU in Minji's Coliseum with you know six eight thousand people in filling up the stadium. Yeah you were and, a USBA boxer or something. Right? So all those fights were sanctioned by the USBA as well some mm-hmm. others that I took you know some Hilton's and some other arenas and stuff and uh, it was a good journey and everything but Back to your fight story, because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not letting you off the hook on this one, Mike. So you were probably reminiscent and, 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 and emulating uh, the two or three fights that broke out there a night. A night. Every single night, they had yeah. two or three fights. And half the time, Mark was in the middle of getting his bouncers on one side and the people out the door on the other side. And uh, Mark Sade was just a, a local legend when it came to brawling and fighting and boxing. Total opposite world of what we're sitting here next to right now. But Laura, she, you know, I'm sure you're like, you know, foreign to all the... Know. But do you watch UFC? Do you watch UFC? Uh, occasionally. Well, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm listening to you and all the love that you and all your siblings had for each other. Yep. And I'm one of four. And our household was a fucking war zone. <laughs> okay. F-bomb alert. Like, F-bomb alert. There was no love shared. <laughs> that we were just like constantly at each other's necks. So it's just like amazing and almost inspiring for me to hear that you and nine of your brothers and sisters were just like peace and harmony and I'm remembering literally grabbing my baby sister by the neck and just on the floor. Well, I'm sorry, baby sister, but... <laughs> she's fine. Yeah, she's fine now. <laughs> she's a better person because of it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I bet her neck is uh, feeling, you know, a little, little, she's little she's rusty. Good. Don't worry about her. Well, Laura, I tell you, um, it wasn't always peace and love and harmony. Like, you know, we had our moments, you know, and so, but, but what I remember is at the end of the day, man, we were a family. And if, if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. And, and you know, and, and I'll just throw in a quick little story real yeah, quick. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was getting ganged up on like five on one, six on one by all these, you know, white kids. And I was the piñata and, you know, the, the mentality was different. This is back in like 1980. And I'm like just turned 10 years old. So I was tired of having to fight like all these kids at the same time. I could hold my own with one or two, but all mm-hmm. of them at the same time was just too much. 
So my brother comes to have my back, right? And my brother is uh, four and a half years older than me, Will. Wilma. Wilma. <laughs> Wilma. <laughs> so Will comes with me, Laura, and we go to school, right? And so he's literally waiting on his bike for me, and we pre-planned to meet in the field to meet these guys, and, like, we're going to go at it. But Will's a lot bigger, right? So he's four and a half years older. All of us are like 10. He's 14. Not fair. Wait. So he goes, okay, fight my brother one-on-one, -on -one, one at a time. So I chose the biggest one, right? So classic story. You hear this all the time. But this is actually a true story with me. Uh -huh. So I, I choose the biggest one. I start tearing them up. You know, I like really getting the better of them. Felt good. My brother jumps in. I was like, breaks us up. I was like, dude, what are you doing? I'm, I'm getting the better of them. Like, he starts coaching the other guy. It's like, I want to see a good fight, you know? And I'm like, dude. And to this day, I will never let my brother live that down because, you know, he, he, he knew that I, he mm -hmm. knew that I was good. He knew overall, he tells me to this day, Pete, I know you had that guy. I just was trying to give him a few pointers to, so I could see a good fight. Cause man, you were just getting, you tearing them up. Making you better too. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But, but. It, you know, if, if somebody was really messing with me, like he would, he would have my back, mm -hmm. but, but I'll never forget that as long as I live 10 years old, my brother is like coach, coaching the other guy against me. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> You what know, are you doing? It's against the rules. You're talking about these stories and all I'm envisioning is the karate kid high school fight scene. I don't know, you, have you seen the karate, not the karate kid, but Cobra, Cobra Kai, Kai on Kai, the Netflix? Man, I've heard so many good uh, things about that. I can just picture you doing roundhouses and just kicking all these people as they're coming at you. Right. <laughs> That's Sunshine Del Fry's language there. I'll, I'll tell you about him. He, he whew, I'm going to tell you, he was a great kickboxer. But anyway. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so Greenville, man, um, what got you out of there? Plus the Link Piano Bar, so let's yeah. go straight into it. So I'm at a Greenville Little League baseball game. If you don't know anything about Greenville, you got to know, Laura, that – Greenville, North Carolina is all about Little League Baseball. Okay. I am unfortunately very familiar with Greenville. Myself. And how, how is this? I lived in Greenville for just about a year and a half. Okay. And that was enough. ECU? No, but thank you. Okay. Um, I had moved out of Florida, and that's just ultimately where me and my ex ended up. So okay. he found a job there. I was just kind of like fumbling around, like trying to find something in my field there. And, um, you know, that was already like a, a first terrible impression. There was nothing in the job market for me. Right. And then I ended up in Greenville Mall. Right. Where I started my career with my current company. The Colonial Mall. The Greenville Colonial, Colonial Mall. Colonial Mall. Uh, yeah. With the graveyard in the parking lot. We're surrounded by uh. a short four foot brick fence that everybody can peer over and see the all Evans the gravestones that Evans family is buried in the <clears throat> Greenville Mall parking lot. That's right. And, you know, walking in and spending my first handful of months in that mall, I'm like, this this place is cursed. Like, I can <laughs> feel it. And then I'm walking, I think I was walking to Carolina Ale House after work one day, and I'm like, is that a headstone? And I'm like, well, that's why it's cursed, because we literally just paved over the founding fathers of Greenville, North Carolina. That's fun. If you haven't seen it, guys, please go see it, because it's actual facts. Field trip. Field trip. Yeah. Actual so, facts. so, so, Pete, I think I'm kind of like jumping the gun here because you've done a lot in your life, man. So, you did a lot while you were still in Greenville. So, I, I think plus is like taking yeah. it's okay. down the road some um, because you got into uh, like acting or something when you were younger. So, so boxing led yeah. to um, this guy Steve Myatt came into. To Chico's. I used to manage Chico's Mexican restaurant downtown Greenville. I don't know if you've ever eaten there. Chips I heard it's pretty best good. Best chips and salsa. I heard it's pretty good. Yeah, best yeah. chips and salsa this side of the Tar River. Um, so, yeah, and so Steve Myatt came in, and um, I recognized him but from Walcott's Elementary. Um, he did a, a parade with us, and he was on stilts, and he was like Uncle Sam, and uh, I just never forgot his face. So when he walked mm -hmm. in 25 years later in the Chico's, I was like, did you do a parade for elementary school wall coats on stilts? And he goes, yeah, I still do those all the time. I was like, I was a little nine, 10 year old, you know, following behind mm -hmm. you and just an amazement of how and he goes, okay, cool. Well, what are you doing now? And we caught up and he came to one of my fights and saw, you know, me box and everything. And he's like, dude, I think you'd be really good for the, for the uh, sets down in Wilmington. 
I'm like, okay, whatever. This guy's creepy now, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, he was well connected. I mean, Laura, the dude was like totally connected with Paramount and Screen Gems and, you know, the whole gamut. And he actually had a long resume of performing through doing stuff on stilts and puppets and acting and children's programming. And, you know, he uh, got me pipelined into Screen Gems and I, you know, sent in some of my boxing fights and, and you know, uh, back then it was VHS tapes, you know, and they pulled me on and got me on the set and next thing you know man I'm I'm like in the middle of movie after movie television show after, you know and and uh really enjoyed it and I di I did it while working at Chico's Mexican restaurant I did it in my vacation times you know so or I'd do it on my days off and I'd drive down there and and drive straight to Wilmington and and get on the set of Screen Gems and and whether it was Dawson's Creek when I was in several episodes thank you Steve Myatt for helping me get on the sets of those and then um, you know, One Tree Hill, the pilot was, was, I was there for that. Um, I was there for, um, you know, I was on the sets for everything from, uh, you know, I was a Russian terrorist in a, in a TV show called CI5, The Professionals. And, uh, in that there is Edward Woodward, which, um, I grew up watching him as the, uh, equalizer on CBS. So it's an old show. And then they brought that back with some, some newer actors, you know, we did a revision of that. And then I, you know, um, I'll try to get it all in, in one run here, Mike, I was mm -hmm. in a movie with John Travolta and Sandra Bullock and, and uh, Ashley Judd. Well, and... you went to school with Sandra Bullock, right? Yeah, well, yeah. no, she went to right. ECU. I went to Pitt Community College. Oh, okay. So yeah. I can't even claim that I went to ECU. I keep it real. You know, yeah. you know, I wasn't even good enough to go to ECU. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the, the grades. I tuned in. I was just was really working, a blue-collar guy. Yeah. Blue-collar all the way, worked hard, played tennis for Pitt. Um, you know, we demolished all the colleges we played. So that was a good run. But... But um, but Sandra, um, back when she was in Greenville, we all called her Sandy. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when she moved away, it was a little odd for us to see her named Sandra. We were like, "Whoa, wait a minute! Where's, what's the Sandra stuff all about?" You so know? did y'all like see her around Greenville? Or? So she would come to Chico's on Monday nights for our draft night. You know, dollar night. Um, we had dollar mugs, and then mm -hmm. she worked at Daryl's. Um, she was a waitress at Daryl's, which is no longer there because the flood, you know, took away Daryl's. But um, but she was a waitress at Daryl's, and we and they had a good Thursday night. So all of ECU would pile into Daryl's on Thursday nights, and uh, and they would make all their money. And then all of ECU would pile into Chico's on Monday nights, and we'd make you know our money on Monday nights. Cha-ching. So, Cha-ching, yeah. And Sandra, look, one thing I can say about Sandy is that um, I, I never really knew her all that well, you mm -hmm. know, um, you know. Uh, we were we were in a movie with Divine Secrets of Yayo Sistergood together, um, and then that was cool to be you know reunited with her and being on the set with her. But um, but that having been said, she's always been true and genuine to her core self. From what everyone in Greenville, her roommates in college who who know her very well and they're still in touch. And Sandra's very real, very genuine, very grounded, and very much herself. And so on the set of Divine Secrets of Yayo Sisterhood, when she did that laugh. It's the same laugh as in Miss Congeniality. So when she did it, I was like, oh, my God, that's the same exact laugh, minus the snort. Um, I was going to say, I'm like, wait, is minus that the snort. snort genuine Sandra Bullock? Because that just made me love her ten times more. My, <laughs> minus the snort. When, I mean, When you so. were on the set, when you saw her, were you like, hey, what's up, Sandy? It's Pete from Chico's. No, no. <laughs> no. I mean, she, she, she uh, you know, we... we we had a good time on that set. I spoke more with James Gardner. I don't know if you remember Maverick or oh, the yeah. Rockford Files. Yeah. And, um, you know, so James Gardner was like six foot five, tall dude, mm -hmm. you know, older guy in his 70s. But, man, he gave me an awesome bear hug. He was kissing all the women. And then I was like, I'll just take a handshake on the line as we wrapped up. And he, that was a big mistake. He picked me up, gave me a hug. My feet were dangling off the ground. I was like, everybody was laughing. Like I could hear Sandra and everybody laughing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, and then they kissed me on the cheek. So I was trying to avoid a kiss and I ended up getting <laughs> a lot more than, than that. But, uh, James Garner was awesome. Um, you know, Ellen Burstein, I mean, just phenomenal icons of Hollywood that would come to, to Wilmington to film, mm -hmm. you know, and Divine Secrets of, of Yaya Sisterhood, we filmed in Faison, North Carolina, which is near Kinston, North Carolina. Yeah. And that was the house that we found for the set that was supposed to be set down in Mississippi in the bayou and stuff. So Now, um, let's go to the Wilmington for a second, because okay. Wilmington used to be called Little Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Uh, I heard that. Wilmywood. Uh, Wilmy Wood. Wilmy Wood. I like that. I never heard that, but that's... that's that rolls that's off the tongue. Ring to it. Yeah, yeah Wilmywood. Um, that's what we called it when we were down there on the set. 
but they would, I heard that because of taxes and stuff that most of Hollywood moved to was it South Carolina to so Georgia to um, Georgia. Georgia so Atlanta let me tell you the real deal there so what happened was um, the governor I will keep all the names out of it because I don't mm-hmm. want any backlash from this being played yeah. later on because I'm gonna get this to really out there but Mike what happened was there was an inside deal and so we gave up that industry the the film industry for another industry called fracking okay yeah so what the two governors did <clears throat> I'm re- I don't know if I'm supposed to say this but they did an inside deal Laura and so one gave up one business for the other and they swapped so we gave up the film industry to get fracking and hammered exclusive right here folks <clears throat> so you heard it here first <laughs> yeah so I'm gonna keep all the names out of it and mm-hmm. I you know watched all that go down and Laura the the film industry brought in five billion dollars five billion dollars <laughs> to to the soft you know that soft you know, income and money was coming in and helped all the hotels, the gas stations, the restaurants, you know, uh, it really helped our soft industry uh, from that hard income through the manufacturing of film. And that was a huge blow to our economy, Mike, because not just Wilmington got that money, but the whole state got that money. And our tax incentives, um, a guy named Guy um, runs the film commission right now. We do have 25% film tax incentives on the table right now today mm. same as back then but georgia gives 35 percent. so you spend a hundred dollars on a film production you're getting back 35 dollars once you complete the audit north carolina only gives back 25 dollars per film production now georgia is keeping it because they have like hundreds of millions of dollars in the kitty in their bank in their budget for film production including commercials and etc um where we only have 34 million dollars in the bank so you know our thresholds are small they're lower um but if you want me to call kai up for this podcast and try to hammer him for a sponsorship to get some tax dollars for you mike i will do that for you bro let's make it happen it's called hammered yeah let's make it happen let's do it let's do it (laughs) um yeah yeah, because they made a lot of movies here man like uh one of my favorite movies and you didn't see it until uh god maximum overdrive about the vehicles that were possessed. That was several months ago, but yes, yeah. that was the first time I had seen it. Yeah, and, and another one of my favorites, Dirty Dancing, was filmed. Uh, if not in Wilmington, though, no, I think no, that no. was filmed out west. Mountains, yeah, yeah, but man, it, it yeah, yeah, I, I, it's a shame because I do know that. Um, oh fuck, I'm losing my losing my train of thought here. Well, let me throw this, in. this one. Let me throw this in real quick. <laughs> so, speaking of Dirty Dancing, mm-hmm. nobody puts baby in a corner. And here I am. Oh, we heard this. Uh, I've already heard what this one. What the fuck, man? Hey, do you want to know? Uh, you might even know this already because you're um, pretty savvy when it comes to stuff like this, movies, and you probably got a lot of knowledge. But did you know Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey hated each other? I did not on, know that. On the set of that movie because they were in Red Dawn together, okay. which was before that, yep. and they couldn't stand each other. Something okay. must have happened. And uh, what's his name? Billy Zane was supposed to be the lead. Oh, wow. And she wanted Billy Zane, and Sarah Jessica Parker was supposed to be Jennifer Grey. Oh, wow. So they casted, you know, Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze. Long story short, she didn't want to work with him. Patrick took her in a room. They both came out teary-eyed, and now you got this blockbuster. And, yeah, and it is. <clears throat> Everything happened the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. That natural progression of working through those negative vibrations and that movie, they – their vibe on the set was electric, mm. you know. And I see so many couples throughout so many dance floors on the clubs trying to emulate the whole lifting the girl up. And it's always an epic fail with exactly. somebody if crashing down to the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, so, But I want to see a good version of you two doing the whole dancing. And he's going to hold you up in the air. And I want you to film it. And I want you to put that video on this Hammered podcast Later on, that's that's the Pete Rivera challenge to, to Pete, I can dance, bro. I can he just dance. sets you up. Yeah, Do you realize like now we have to follow. Yes, through. I want to see a future podcast with a little clip of you running up to him. He's holding you up in the air. You're out like this. We're doing the whole dirty dancing remake. I think we can make this happen at Plus Dueling Piano Bar. Uh oh, uh oh, game on! I got to start game working on out again. You know. Wow. First of all, Corona took my strength when I had it. What can I say? Drink Corona Light. I mean, Corona Light. <laughs> yeah, I will say, Mike, I'm glad you've you've completely healed from Corona, right? And a COVID nineteen yeah. is a is a killer, and uh, and it's good to see you healthy and strong, and doing this again. So uh, you know, for well, those of you out there, 
Mike Bird, you know, took it on the chin. I'd called him several times. He was coughing up. I mean, I'd have to wait 30 seconds from the finished coffin. I was like, dude, you want me to call you back later? <laughs> no, bad. man. Hold on. <laughs> uh, I'll get through this. Hold on. Uh, Mike, I'll just call mm. you later, man. And uh, <laughs> But he got, hey, look, he got through it. Here he is. <laughs> and, um, I mean. and, 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 and Nurse Laura here, <laughs> Nurse Laura had to, to nurse him to health. And, I'm uh, just going to, you know, go out on a limb and here and say, like, he survived because of me. Yeah, so, there you go. Not going to argue that. There you Actual go. facts. Yep, yep. I, I will say, uh, like, I was one of those people that were like, this shit isn't real, this is bullshit, you know, masks, blah, blah, blah. And sort of, kind of, I'm still that way with the mask thing. Right. I mean, yeah, I, I know why people do it, but right. I hate wearing them. I do But, too. man, I'm going to tell you, it affects everybody different because that shit hit me and it laid me up. I didn't lose my smell or taste but man, I got everything else. I hear and, you. And um, right now, I'm still coughing from it. So I still oh, think really? it, wow. it it did like some long term effects to my lungs. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Just waiting. People say it takes months for it to go away. God. So see, and I yeah. I'm I'm fearful of that. Like that's a concern of mine <coughs> because I got Laura back in March. I'll never forget this. Listen to this. March 27th, 1997. I came down with a bad case of double pneumonia in my lungs. Ow. And so they did the x-ray and they showed, like, they put the stuff in and they, they showed your dye in your mm -hmm. lungs. There. And mine from top to bottom on both my lungs was filled with pneumatic fluid. And so it did some long-term damage to my lungs. So I feel like I'm pre-susceptible, predisposed to, like, this might, you know, be really bad for me yeah. because of my weak lungs. So I'm trying to stay away. And uh, with that being said, Mike, I know you hate wearing masks, but do you mind wearing one for the rest of the show? Man, Luckily, I don't have one within arm's reach. Right. So. We do have is a brand new bottle of hand, hand sanitizer. sanitizer. There you go. Please yeah. help yourself. There you go. You know and what? earlier today, yeah. there you go. I'll do it. I did do a show last night, so I did earlier today spray down everything. Okay, so it's, it's all, all all sanitized. Um, <laughs> Look, I was just teasing, man. I, yeah. I wouldn't want you to wear a mask. I can't stand wearing those things either. I mean, we have to wear them in our building uh, where Plus is. You know, I live upstairs. Yeah. And so Tony and I both were living upstairs for a while when we opened up Plus, but we'll get the Plus. I know it's a teaser, folks, but we're going to get the Plus. We are going to get there. Yeah, I'm going to touch on it right now, actually, just a little bit. Not not a lot, but um, for people that are skeptical about going out because of, you know, the coronavirus and social distancing, man, you guys at Plus do it. Like, you guys go above and beyond. Well, we have um, to. We have to. We have to. Okay, so every night that we're open, Mike, mm -hmm. the someone from the police department, whether it's a police chief themselves or a high captain comes through and does a walkthrough with someone from the fire department, whether it's a fire chief themselves or someone very high up with the fire department, along with a representative for events for the city of Raleigh. So you have a direct person from the governor side of things, the police side of things and the fire chief side of things. And all three of them come through and do a walkthrough every single night that we're open. Mm. And we're only open from six to nine on Fridays and Saturdays, but they show up like clockwork, you know, mm. and sometimes I have to come running downstairs just to do walkthroughs with them and they're doing their job. And you know what? I don't take it personally, or I don't take it personally. I'm thankful because they're keeping us all safe and there's effort and it's on a unified front. And look, yes, you're right. We, we have a lot of hand sanitizer, like every six feet. We mm -hmm. have, you know, um, masks for everybody. If you show up not wearing a mask, we have one for you. Um, we all wear masks. Um, everybody in the back house is wearing, you know, gloves and switching out gloves. We go through more gloves now today than ever because we're constantly switching out our hand gloves. Um, and then we're very, very careful about making sure that every single time you know, these customers get up and I'm, I'm going to apologize to you in advance for you guys coming in, uh, mm -hmm. coming up Saturday. Um, but I'll be the first one to say, man, if you're going to the bathroom, put on your mask, mask you up. know, mask it up. You Actually, know, I think it was the last time we were there. Uh, we were on our way out and we were crossing the floor to say goodbye to somebody and I forgot my mask. And Michael is like, put your mask on. They're staring at You're you. You're being stared and at. I'm like, oh, Zero Jesus, in on I'm you. sorry. Like, <laughs> yeah. I swear I forgot. I'm not trying to breathe my coronavirus yeah. on you guys, but really, like, hats off to how serious it's taken because yeah. we both figured out this isn't, like, 
propaganda. This is a very real thing that is happening, and we have to do our part to keep each other safe. Absolutely. And not take it personally along the way. You know, let's all do our part. Let's all care for one another. Let's all be considerate of one another. And we're doing a top notch. And, you know, I'm thankful for the feedback. So the fire department, the police department, the city of Raleigh have said, you guys are doing your part. Mm -hmm. We have no qualms with the way that you're running your business at Plus Doing Piano Bar. We know that before we walk in here now that there's sincere and genuine effort being exerted throughout the night on keeping Mm -hmm. everybody safe at all times. Um, But they're doing their job. And, you know, we don't take it personally. We welcome it. Um, and, and we keep all the tables six feet apart, you know, yeah. so, um, it's going to, but, but, but I will say this, we've somehow managed to maintain the electricity and the vibe in there. You know, you still hear the whole crowd go, pa pa pa. you know, sweet Caroline. You don't want me to sing dun, any longer. Dun, than dun. There you go. Good times. Never. I don't feel so it. good. Goodbye. So good. Yes. So, so good. good. So good. good. Okay. That's it. Because, uh, we, we want to, <laughs> don't want to lose customers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. But the vibe is there, the electricity is there. You know, even though we have a smaller, thinner crowd, it's a small but mighty crowd. And you know what they do in there? Laura, they get hammered. Yeah. Oh boy, he did it. I did. Like, cue the theme song. I got one too. Yeah. I'll add it later. Cool. Um, hey, so uh, one thing that I see happening to downtown Raleigh, and I know we got listeners from all over the world, so if you're not familiar with Raleigh, North Carolina, and the downtown scene, um, excuse me, because I'm going to go in a little tangent for a second. Um, so this past week, um, you know Zach Medford. Um, he owns Coglins. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know Coglins is closing, ah. and that's like a staple of downtown Raleigh. And so I'm, sorry, Zach. We love you. I, I am just shocked that more places aren't going under like this. They are. There's several um, more that are about to go under. It's almost like the mayor of Raleigh has this vendetta against bars and wants downtown Raleigh to be straight clean now and it's frustrating because I'm just waiting on Cornerstone to go belly up now um, don't thank- worry about Cornerstone don't worry about Cornerstone Dan yeah, Lovenheim's doing a great job very smart mind you know when it comes to clubs and when it comes to business and then when it comes to preparing preparing for everything that might happen in the bar scene and the bar business Dan Lovingheim has done a phenomenal job of playing that game of chess, you know, and Laura, I'll tell you, you know, I've learned a lot from Dan, you know, we've become closer lately. He's actually helped me out um, on a few things and projects. We just partnered up on uh, bringing the champions, the guy who lost his title to Mike Tyson, James Bonecrusher Smith. We brought him to Knuckle Up and Mm -hmm. he's part owner of Knuckle Up Boxing Gym. And we just did an event and we watched a Roy Jones Jr. fight with uh, Mike Tyson. And, um, you know, um, so Dan's, Dan's got a phenomenal way of running things and setting things up so that he has lots of options no matter what happens. So even though there's not a lot of business going through Cornerstone right now today, Mm -hmm. know that that was the number two account in the whole entire city of North Carolina for liquor sales. You know what the number one account in all of North Carolina was for liquor sales? Do you know what it was? Or what it probably still is now today. Mm -hmm. The Charlotte Airport. Oh wow! So nothing about that surprises me. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's 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 the Charlotte Airport and um, and Cornerstone. There you go. Wow, that's crazy. Cornerstone's like three buildings and some patios, some decks, and it's all college kids for the most part. Yeah, and they're old yeah. homes. They're like actual homes, houses. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I just hope I'm glad Plus is still open. I know it took you guys forever to get back to that point but thank god you guys are back like i'm excited for saturday um ready to tear it up and so we kind of i drew us off track okay so i'm we're gonna go you went from greenville okay now you're like an actor you're being in these movies tv shows um now what happened to get you off on this professional like Rebel Nation. What started this? Or did something happen in between that? Well, kind of. There's a medley of stuff. And, and I got to be honest with you, nothing was actually planned at that mm-hmm. moment in time when I was in Greenville. Um, I did start on this journey um, four years ago. Um, but I knew that eventually I would have to get out of Greenville to realize it and make it all you know happen. So what I did, what I did discover in Greenville was um, my brother turned me on to the law of attraction, you know, and so we've talked a little bit about the law of attraction, 
you know, manifesting life, making life happen for you, not just being filled with hopes and dreams, but actually put things in action items, attach it to milestones, go out there and, and you know, the law of attraction summed up as thoughts become things. And so you got to really make that work for you and really, you know, be assertive and aggressive. So I, I championed all those philosophies in Greenville. That's what happened mm-hmm. to, to really be poised and ready to, to come out of Greenville. And, um, and so when I got the call from, from uh, Tony that he wants to – I was in the parking lot of a Greenville Little League baseball game at Elm Street Park. Now, did you know Tony before? Oh, yeah. This, Tony or... and I became good friends when I had a dueling piano bar and restaurant. And uh, my brother, Mike Rivera, and I had Cafe Caribe in Greenville, North Carolina. And okay. so Tony was our entertainment director. And um, we just kind of flip-flopped a little bit from then to now. So now I do all the heavy lifting for him and kind of like, you know, protect him a little bit with, with plus. And, um, and so, you know, and, 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 and I'll get back to that real quick, but I will say that what happened in Greenville is I finally discovered myself. And so it took me time to figure out my core values, my core principles, what am I going to live for? You know, who am I? What do I want to really live as far as passion? And then implement that. And so I, um, that all happened in Greenville for me. But I knew it would happen outside of Greenville as far as moving away to make all these dreams come true, you know. And uh, so when I got the call from Tony, he's like, his pitch to me was, Pete, man, if you help me get this dueling piano bar up and, and restaurant and you manage it and, you know, we'll, we'll live upstairs and all that good stuff, um, you know, I'll help you with, with making sure that your dreams come true in the way of entertainment and your film studios. I know you want to build film studios for movies and television shows and music production and everything. And I know that that's what you've been working for. And I think that we can make it happen quicker, faster, stronger together in Raleigh. So there you go. He won me over, got me to drop my advertising marketing firm that I had down in Greenville. And I went all in with Plus Dueling Piano Bar. And um, here we are, you know, and then a year into it, Lo and behold, you know, uh, thank you, Raleigh, North Carolina, for Mm -hmm. voting us the number one live entertainment venue in all of Raleigh. You know, and we're up, as far as live entertainment venues, let's talk about this one second. Let's not breeze over this. You got Walnut Creek Amphitheater. You got Red Hat. You've got Lincoln Theater. You've got the Ritz. You've got, you know, and here this little Mm rinky-dink dueling piano bar comes along, and we get voted the number one entertainment venue. And we we only hold... 700 people but you hold that every night friday saturday thursday well maybe not thursday but friday and saturday my god that place is packed pre-covid times yes pre-covid times yes yes so we're we're safe now folks we're safe (laughs) we're we're very much a fourth of that yeah but we want to get back to that eventually yeah sometime when it's safe and i gotta tell you man um so i've been to plus a few times and uh, the last time I was there, I, this is an testament to uh, your work ethic, man. Um, I'm sitting there, and I see Pete with his hat on, running around, carrying trash bags out. Oh, yeah. I'm like, this dude, you know, he's the GM of the place, you know. And, you know, you, you walk around, you shake hands, you're doing videos for social media. And then you're in the back with the kitchen. You're back there helping get drinks out. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. You, you're the man, bro. You guys. Well, no. Nah, and it takes a man to recognize a man. So you're the man. And so, <laughs> and, and, and so, but I will say this and humbly, you know, and, and you gave me a softball pitch. So, Laura, mm. I'm going to look at you and I'm going to direct this with you. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. So, humbly, you know, um, I built Rebel Nation, right? So, we've got a lot to talk about there. And, you you know, we've got some investors that were courting, some serious big-time investors. We're dealing with angel funds. We're dealing with hedge funds. We're dealing with investment groups. We're dealing with doctors. We're dealing with all kinds of potential investors. And then the one thing that popped up recently on top of your business plan and executive summary and one sheet and your IPs and your, you know, your intellectual properties and everything you've built and your patents and everything, um, which we're an IT media production company, and we'll get into all that. IT media and production. Don't forget it. Rebel Nation Enterprises, Inc., IT media production. Write it down. Yeah, take a picture. It's actually on the screen right now. There you go. Yeah. Write it down. Take a picture. Um, so here I am washing dishes at Plus the Link Piano Bar right now. I'm a, I'm a glorified dishwasher and cook and maitre d' and whatever. God knows, whatever needs to be done, yeah, I'll gladly do it. No problem. Out of love for Tony. I love... Plus, I love Tony. I love what we created there. 
all kudos to Tony and Nikki and Nikki. She was there from second one and and Tony would not be Tony as a person without Nikki and Tony would not be Tony with Plus Dueling Piano Bar without Nikki. So kudos to Nikki Lukens. She deserves her I had a, sunlight. I had, I had Tony in here uh, right before the pandemic or like in April. So I guess it was during it. Okay. And he was like, there's no way I could get Nikki in here. She would never do something like this. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'd like to get him and Nikki on the show. And I admire Nikki so yeah. much. She does a lot um, across the board, period. And right now she's even just moonlighting for the heck of it for her passion, working at the Asheville zoo with lions and tigers and bears oh my, oh my. What? yes oh and so no. and she's a drummer by night and an animal lover all day it's laura's love minute. language over there wait a minute because she's got tony animal Nikki, lovers. girl we're she, doing this yeah. call me yeah she's the bomb.com so but so humbly here i am washing dishes and i just got another company to come in and evaluate my company rebel nation which tony's a part of he's part owner co-founder um i you know that's our arrangement and it's going to do very well for them. And my goal is for them to have a better life outside of Plus in those four walls with Rebel Nation than inside of those four walls. That's my goal for them. And so that having been said, Laura, do you know that a third party by a federal court judge who does this for a living, who's also a CPA on the side, um, but he's a sitting on the bench, a federal court judge, not a little county district, federal court judge, more power than the president technically as far as laws, um, just assessed our company and did a company evaluation, a business evaluation. I'm going to let you go first, then Mike, you go second. Guess how much he says that Rebel Nation is now worth today pre-launch prior to Play You and Rebel You, looking at all of our lay of the land, all of our IPs, our IT stuff, our productions. Take a wild guess of, of what he says our company's worth today. I'll give you a clue. It's over $1 million and it's under... A lot. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me a little bit of wiggle room. Um, okay. I'm going to throw out $16 million. Okay, that's a good guess. Thank you very much. Mike, quick. I'm going to go with 10.5 mil. Okay, so if you add them both together, you're oh. still... You, you add them both together, and you're at a quarter, 25% of what he says it's worth. He says it's worth 100, 100, over $100 million. Oh, wow. With, Congratulations. So you know how you're selling yeah. a house oh, in the market? Wow. So, you know, he's, he's, you know, you sell a house. You have to have three comparisons mm -hmm. to sell your house to get a market value, right? Well, he did that with what we are coming out with. And, and he says, Pete, this is a very low-balled estimate. We, I clearly see you're headed to the Bs, which I don't want to even say the mm -hmm. word. You know, but but uh, billions. He, yes, <laughs> got to do this. <laughs> so, um, so long story short, here I am having a company that's we're not and, and the cash flow is not there. I mean, we're not mm -hmm. waddling in cash. It's just what we built and we're all well onto it. So we're penniless as far as cash in the bank and you know having extra abundance of cash right now. The cash is just not there yet because we haven't launched yet. Everything yeah. is built and constructed. It's like building your house and now your house is worth X. You know, after you're done building it, but. Laura, I'm washing dishes at Plus Dueling Piano Bar, knowing that I have a company that's worth $100 million, and I gladly do it because I love Plus. I love Tony. I love Nikki. Mm -hmm. I gladly do it because they're family. Like, we build things together, you know? And if you don't do things for your core inner circle, then what are you doing? I mean, yeah. what are you building, you know? And that is a true testament to leadership. And that's something that just kind of rings to me, having been in many management and leadership roles. There's such a stark contrast between managing and leading, and you, sir, obviously a leader. Well, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm a humble servant leader if, if at that, and I like to empower people to, to really be empowered to be in their own lane, right, and and not micromanage, right, and just empower them to, to really shine and bring their best and We've, we've got so many people with our company that, that are really ready to roll up their sleeves and bring an exorbitant amount of value to Rebel Nation. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm very humbled and honored to, ha to be surrounded by greatness. I'm truly surrounded by greatness, Laura. And... And You're these welcome. people are very established. Yep, I got Laura to my to my right, and Mike Bird uh, to my left, and and uh, I'm surrounded by greatness. There you go. <laughs> and Laura leaves the studio. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, but but um, no, but I'm surrounded by greatness in Rebel Nation and um, and at Plus, and um, and you know, it, it took a long time to be humble and hungry and find that that balance of. 
of, you know, being relatable and likable and investable. And so if you can't share with your vision with people and they can't mm-hmm. believe in you and trust in you and confide in you and run with you, then what are you building, you know? And so you have to be worthy of people to give, like, what's what you've done with ATB, Mike? You know, mm-hmm. you, you started it from a concept, a mustard seed in your thought process, and look at you now, you know? And, um, you know, it all starts with thoughts become things, law of attraction, you know, and you implement it. And some people say, oh, knowledge is power. Well, Laura, I'm here to tell you that in order to really get hammered, <laughs> it's applied knowledge that's power. Uh, Cue the theme song. <laughs> yeah. Dun, dun, dun. There you go. So applied knowledge is power. It's, it's you know, you really got to really apply an action plan with milestones and, and make it all happen and build it. And I did this with with a big group of people. Um, Amitabha Mandal, our key IT CTO partner, um, phenomenal human being. Uh, Joel Givens, who Tony introduced me to, um, phenomenal magician, mentalist, who brings a lot of good networking to the table and relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, Tony Basford, owner of Plus Doing Piano mm-hmm. Bar, who's been my biggest cheerleader and confidant and best friend, best friend you could ever wish for. Um, you know, Gary D. Krenzel, who I drove all the way up to Princeton. He took me to Einstein's house and, uh, you know, side story. Einstein's house in Princeton, New Jersey, on the front of it, on the gate, you know what the sign marker says? Private property. Keep off. Einstein's house should be a national monument with like, here is the house of one of the greatest ingenuitive minds of the 19th century, you know, Albert Einstein and Nothing. It's completely private. Like you can't have access to it at all. Or, it, somebody or, lives there. Somebody lives there. Oh, and, uh, that was my next question. Was like, <laughs> who lives there? Like, That's who is question. not like funding this as a museum? That's like, right. Why are we just sleeping on this opportunity? You're exactly right. Literally, oh, I would be like living there and sleeping favorite, on this opportunity. That would be my favorite party story. Every party I go to, hey, I live in Einstein's house. How about <laughs> that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, I, you're not like hoping for numbers from that, right? Like, I, you know, some people might want to come over. You know, I mean, if I was single, I'd use that to my advantage. Good cover. But Good yeah, cover. yeah, yeah. Of course. Good cover. She <laughs> got a little tinge in her eyes. Your eyes like, Arr. no. Try that. Try that. And we'll see. We'll, exactly. See if it works. But I don't how live in Einstein's house. Lucrative so. that is. <laughs> well, Pete, I got a question for you because you touched okay. on Revel Nation, man. Give I got the website pulled up right here so everybody can see it. Uh, yep. Tell me, what is Revel Nation? Okay, so we're an IT production and media company. We're a budding company. Um, I started heavier on the production side, then COVID hit, you know, and I was already, you know, morphing, evolving. And more people are apt to invest into a big tech IT company than they are to production. So when you look at the history of... Laura, like return on investment and what people are looking to invest into a solid company and then get back a solid return, tech companies are it. IT companies are it, you know? So you develop good software, platforms as a service, you develop, you know, solve problems. So to get to Rebel Nation, um, Eddie Blackwell, uh, proprietor for Funtime Promotions out of Greenville, North Carolina, took me down to an ASI show in Orlando, Florida about five years ago. And I was able to hear Steve Wozniak speak to a small group of us. There's like 60 people there. And one of like the founders we were, of Microsoft. Yeah. yeah okay. One of the co-founders of, of Apple. Apple. Oops. Yeah. Whoops. Steve Jobs. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft, Apple. I knew and, it was one of the big computer you know, companies. Yeah. Bill Gates, you know, Steve Jobs. Yeah. So um, so he co-founded Apple with, with, you know, Steve Jobs. So Steve Wozniak, call him the Woz, looked at us and goes, look, guys, I'm going to challenge you all to do what I did. You know, don't go chasing money. Laura, you know what he said? No, because you weren't there. Let me tell you. (laughs) Let me tell you. What he said was, was profound, changed my life. You know, right there after I found the law of attraction, he tells me this. He goes, don't go chasing money. Do what I did. I'm going to challenge all of you to do what I did. Go solve a major problem. And when you solve that major problem, you can't run from the money fast enough. Do you know that I left that meeting with goosebumps and chills? And uh, they're all like grease. They're chills and they're multiplying. Okay. Well, we're going to roll tonight. Yep. So, um, and I was losing control. I'm going to have a soundtrack produced just for this episode. So, so yeah, you can put in the memes and all that good stuff. You can put John Travolta going to, you know, which, by the way, I saw him do in person with Steve Buscemi and Vince Vaughn. Um, So, so I left that meeting 
profoundly changed, right? So I'm going to myself, oh my God, what problem am I going to solve? You know, what's out there? And you really have to take a real reflection of, you know, you're the sum total of all the choices you've made. You have to take a deep dive into what really are you living for? You know, yes, you have kids. You got to do something where you have balance, you know, where you can still be a father, still be a, you know, have valuable time. What do you, and so the entertainment industry really appealed to me, being on the sets, being in the movies. Do I want to be in the camera still? No. Do I want to evolve from being an actor? Yes. Well, let me go behind the camera. Let me do much like you're doing. You're, this is a production for you. So putting together projects, productions. Okay, so I evolved to that step. I evolved to really getting in good with the music industry, with with all of production for music, for all of production for film, TV. And, and I was able to navigate up those waters. And I entered a pitch competition in, in L.A. A pitch competition. A reality TV show pitch competition. Okay, gotcha. So I, I flew out to L.A. Well, I went to real screen. And uh, we'll get to Rebel Nation. And I pitched, um, which this is the backbone for Rebel Nation. Um, I pitched um, my slate of TV shows to all the networks. This is uh, pre-COVID. Everybody's like, oh, my God, how do you get your hands on all these celebrities? How are they working with you on all these different television shows? Mm -hmm. We've got the Mama Ali television show. We've got the Joel Gibbons Magic That Rock show. And in that show, you know, he's friends with Tom Brady, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods flew him down to the Masters. Um, he's my partner in this as well, another co-founder. Um, and, um, and so, he, you know, he, he entertained Tiger's you know, guests, and Tiger's like, look, dude, I'd like for you to work on my mind a little bit. Joel looks right at Tiger and goes, hey, look, man, you've won this. You got this. You got this, man. And Tiger was like, what? Said, yeah, uh, wait, yeah, you've got this. You've done it. it. Go ahead, man, you're good. So Tiger goes out and wins the damn thing, right? So he wins the Masters. So Tiger, the next day... The, Is this the last Masters he well, won? Well, the or? one that he won two years ago. Oh, okay. Ago. Yeah, so okay. he had to do the green jacket to the yeah. one that just won it this time around. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, so so either a Tiger's manager or producer or one of the people around Tiger's texting um, or emailing Joel was like, hey, man, having dinner with Tiger, he's perplexed. He wants to know something. Did he win the Masters or did you win the Masters? Because he's a mentalist magician, right? So he mm -hmm. didn't know if he'd put a, like a voodoo curse on him. <laughs> and Joel was like, man, it was just power of positive suggestion, which mm -hmm. all of those projects, all of those things, all these celebrities that we deal with, and I deal with a lot, um, was the backbone for the birth of Rebel Nation. So Rebel Nation um, has gotten me all the way to the point where our IT productions are looking solid to have a platform as a service so we can put all these productions in my own version of YouTube, in my own version of TikTok. And so we're producing all this media and all these productions and shows and whatnot, but they're going to be on our own platforms as a service, and it's tailor-made for all of academia. And so that's Rebel U. Go ahead. All right, that was part one of my interview with Pete Rivera from Revel U and Revel Nation. Also, general manager at Plus Dual and Piano Bar in downtown Raleigh. Come see them on Friday and Saturdays from 6 to 9. They're going to rock your world, I guarantee. Tony Bassford and Eric Forbes on those ivories and Pete uh, running around doing his thing are going to give you a great customer service experience and you're going to have a blast in those three hours. Check out the next episode of Hammered. I'm going to have part two of my interview with Pete. He'll be talking about the new app coming out soon, Play You. Um, can't wait to hear about that. And also, Miss Laura May will be joining us for episode two also. If you enjoyed this episode of Hammered or if you didn't enjoy it, hey, share it. Anyway, there's several ways you can do it. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, through your Alexa app, and tune in. Uh, find us on Stitcher. Uh, we are soon coming to Pandora and iHeartRadio. But until then, we're also on Podcast Addict, Podchaser, Pocket Cast, Deezer, Listen Notes, Player FM. We are all over, so there's no excuse not to be listening to the Hammered Podcast. All right, until then, everybody, be good, be nice, give somebody a hug. All right, peace out, everybody.